Father God, thank you that we can open the Bible and that this is your word to us. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have to say to us so that we become more like Jesus in whose name we're going to pray. Amen. Well, as we start another year together, I want to start off with a very small sermon series looking at Paul's letter to Philemon. And if you want to look it up in your Bible, it's somewhere between Hebrews and uh, Titus. It's only a one-page letter. Let me read it for you. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you'll be, you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me, so that he would take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. What a gorgeous letter. The more I read it, the more excited I get about it. This is the only sample of Paul's private correspondence that has been preserved for us today and for us to study. It's a private letter, yet it seems also to be an open letter to the church that was meeting in the home of Philemon. Now, it's suggested that Apphia might have been uh, his wife and Archippus might have been Philemon's son. So it gives me the image of a nice little house church. And so this is a family letter about a family matter, a runaway slave. It's also known as the courteous or courteous epistle. And the reason is that Paul writes very tactfully and a little bit tongue in cheek using very clever wordplay of the type used by Roman and Greek teachers. He builds rapport, he persuades the mind and he moves the emotions. And what really excites me about this letter, and that in a fascinating way, the more I read the letter, the clearer I see the analogy of the gospel in this particular letter. The point of this letter was to persuade Philemon not to punish, but to reinstate his runaway slave called Onesimus. And especially as through Paul's ministry, this runaway slave has now become a born-again Christian. So Philemon is now to treat this runaway slave as a brother in the Lord. So that's a bit of the background. But let's have a look at the task 
that has to be achieved by this letter. Because invariably in those days, runaway slaves in Roman society were crucified. The Romans of that day found that to be a very effective deterrent. I don't know about you, but I think like, yeah, that would probably work for me too. The runaway slaves, they were crucified in public. It took several days to die in excruciating agony. The bodies were left out for the birds and the dogs to eat. Now that sounds like a very effective deterrent to me. And it seems like Onesimus, this runaway slave, and Paul, they have a problem with no simple solution at all. Because Paul now has to try and placate the the slave master, Philemon, who lives in a Roman-dominated town. So it seems to me like the verdict is going to be very clear, isn't it? If Onesimus goes home, it's nail him to a cross. That's how you deal with this particular problem. By the way, Philemon is a Greek name, who, and it means this, loving, affectionate kiss. What a name! I mean, you know, if, if I'd say to you, let's go to Philemon's place for a coffee after church, you'd be going like, ah, oh, big hugs, you know, this, 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 we're going to the house of the big hugs. This guy's going to greet us with a big hug. You can just feel it. He's a teddy bear kind of guy. So without even trying, Paul has a wonderful play of images that are going on here. Because when you think of a Roman slave master, what's the image that comes to mind? You know, cruelty, whipping, degrading of another human being. That's what I think about when I think about a slave master. But what does Paul, what does Philemon's name mean? It means loving, affectionate kiss. Well, there goes my image. Well done, Paul. Just using the name. The barriers are already coming down. And indeed, perhaps this gives us some insight into the character of Philemon. Perhaps he wasn't such a hard taskmaster. After all, maybe he was a gentle leader of his family and his business. Anyway, Paul has to conciliate this slave master without humiliating the slave, Onesimus. And Paul has to commend the repentant wrongdoer without making excuses for his offence. Somehow Paul has to balance the claims of justice and mercy all at the same time. Now remember, I I said to you, I see a gospel outline here as well. Isn't this exactly what the Lord Jesus has to do on our behalf? He has to present us to the Father even though we are rebellious sinners. And the Bible clearly says the wages of sin is what? Death. Somehow Jesus has to present us, a guilty people, to the Father in such a way that the claims of justice are met and mercy is given to us, even though we don't deserve it. What a task! Well, let's have a look at the solution. Paul very cleverly touches Philemon's heart. Several times he mentions that Paul is a prisoner for the gospel's sake. Have a look at verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So here he's he's starting to, you know, as he he wants to persuade Philemon, he says, now look at me, I'm in a difficult situation. Verse 9 he says, Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So the image is now, Paul's old. He's writing this letter. You've got to have respect for your elders, particularly the apostle Paul, who's having a hard time. He's in jail. He's in prisoner because of Jesus. In verse 10, he says, while I was in chains. He's not just a prisoner. He's chained up whilst he's writing this letter, this old man. Old men shouldn't be in prison chained up, should they? No, that's wrong. And he even talks about Epaphras in verse 23, his fellow prisoner. So he's surrounded, he's a prisoner surrounded by prisoners. Paul, the prisoner, speaks on behalf of Onesimus, the prisoner slave. Wow. In like manner, Jesus became like one of us, didn't he? 
He lived in human flesh, but he became sin for us. He identified with us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Like Paul, Jesus fully identified with our condition. Well, let's move on. Frankly and fully, Paul has to recognize here Philemon's most excellent Christian character. I love the way Paul writes because as Paul writes this way, he's going to make it very difficult for Philemon to refuse to live up to his excellent reputation. And so he's going to lead Philemon to deal graciously with the faults of Onesimus. Have a look at verse 1. He writes to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. So as, as Philemon write, opens up the letter and he starts to read it out to, to the family church, you know, friend, fellow worker, you know, you can feel his chest pumping. I'm, I'm up there with Paul, you yeah? know. Good luck, I am. Verse 7, your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. I like that. I would like to be described by that, that way by the, the Apostle Paul, wouldn't you? Verse 20, confident of your obedience. See, he's been puffed up nicely and Paul's going, yep, uh, yeah, whatever you say, Paul, I'm, I'm the man that you're talking about in this particular letter. And here I see Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Our Lord Jesus worked. Our Lord Jesus loved. Our Lord Jesus was obedient. Just like Philemon. He worked, he loved, and he was obedient. Let's move on a little further. Paul very cleverly delays even mentioning the name of this penitent Onesimus until he'd paved the way. The first mention of Onesimus, Onesimus or one Simus, as what you might want to call him, Onesimus, the first mention is not until verse 10. So that's just over a third of the way through this letter. By the way, Onesimus his name is fascinating. It means profitable and useful. Now, I'm sure in the first instance, Philemon would have hoped to make some profit. He would have bought this slave. I want to make some profit out of Onesimus as a slave. But now he's not just the object of profit. He's actually become useful as a Christian brother. Wow, this is a changing of status here, isn't it? Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. We were once slaves to sin, but now we are useful to God. Jesus has made it that way. We can enter in as priests into the very presence of the throne room of God himself. How amazing the change in our character. Useful, profitable for God. That's what we are now because of our Lord Jesus. Well, let's move on a little bit further to, to my fourth point. After presenting his request... Paul assumes that Philemon would do as he requested. Look at verse 21. Paul says, I'm confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Confidence. When I think of confidence, I think of Jesus standing before the tomb of Lazarus. And here's what it says in, in John's Gospel, John eleven forty one. 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Paul was confident of obedience. Jesus is confident of his relationship with the Father, so confident that he can stand at the tomb of a dead man and say, come out! One day Jesus is going to do the same thing and all the dead in Christ will rise. Hey, woo! <laughs> 
What a day that will be. Confidence. But look at the way Paul writes. Even though he has the full authority as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, he could simply command that Philemon do as he's told. Verse 8. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. He could have done that. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. Philemon was one of those Gentiles. Paul could have said, this is what you're going to do, do it. But instead, we hear him give the entreaty as a dear friend and brother. Verse 1, he talks to Philemon as dear friend. Verse 7, he's referred to as brother. Verse 20, he's referred to as brother again. Paul puts aside everything and simply makes the appeal on the basis of mutual love. Have a look at verse 9. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Here is the great authority, Paul, speaking to his brother who he loves. And he talks about the love that they share together. This is the love that Christians have for one another. Well, what did the Lord Jesus say? In John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Love is what drives us as human beings, as Christians, to work together. And Jesus says in John 15, verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. How wonderful it is that we have been restored to relationship with God and now we do things because we've been restored to God in such a way that we no longer do things because it's your job. No, we do it because we love one another. That becomes the motivator of our hearts. Do you see what's going on here? Paul is showing you this is, this is the way that you make your big decisions. This is the way that, that relationships get transformed in an incredible way that once a slave servant now becomes your brother. Wow. I love the way Paul writes. My sixth point. Paul frankly acknowledges that there was wrong done. In, in verse 11, he, he refers to Anisimus as being useless. He says, he says, formerly he was useless to you, but now he's become useful both to you and to me. And he promises to make good any loss. Look at verses 18 and 19. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing to this to you with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Says this old man in chains. How could you dare to do anything else except for what he says? Huh? So it seems that there might have been some theft or some breakage in, involved, but, but how could you dare to ask Paul to pay for it? This old man in chains in prison. Oh, how's he going to pay for it? For goodness sakes. But I don't dare say anything to him. Look at the, the way he writes a letter to me. You can imagine what's going on in Philemon's brain. But amazingly, Jesus also did something incredible. He paid what we owe. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, this huge debt paid in such a way that not only is the debt paid so it's null and void, we become something completely different. We become the righteousness of God. Let that settle into your spirit for a second. You are the righteousness of God. You have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. How transformed have you been from a mere worm of a human being, a sinful rebel, into the very righteousness of God through what the Lord Jesus has done for you. Praise God. He's paid the debt that we owe and given us a bonus. Paul goes on to make very careful use of his words to avoid any irritation. Have a look at verse 15. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back for good. I like the way Paul writes. You know, he doesn't want to irritate Philemon. You know, he says Onesimus was separated. It just, just, was just a bit, you know, he's just over there. He doesn't say, you know, this useless runaway slave that absconded with your goods. No, he was just 
he was just, this bloke was just separated for a little while. Merely separated. What a salesman. Fortunately, no one needs to be a salesman for us to God. The Bible was very unequivocal about it. Listen to this. Colossians chapter 1, verses, verse 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Look at yourself that way. Holy. Without blemish. I'm looking forward to that day. Free from accusation. Satan, the accuser, can say what he wants, but he's got nothing on you. Because Jesus paid the debt in full. Hey? Good news. But Paul changes direction a little bit. He's also very careful in how he ministers to Onesimus. Can you imagine how hard it would have been in those perilous days as a runaway slave to return to your master because you know he has the legal right to crucify you? He doesn't have to take you to court. He can just get you nailed up. That's that. End of story. So if you came back and he was a really nice master... Well, you'd at least expect a sound beating, wouldn't you? Paul thinks that it would not be good for a slave to meet his outraged master alone. What Paul does is to arrange for Philemon's friend, Tychicus, to accompany Onesimus and act as mediator. By the way, Tychicus means fortuitous. Keep that in mind for a second. Tychicus means fortuitous. Now, where do I find that name of Tychicus in this letter we've been reading? Well, I don't. You've got to find that somewhere else. But when I was reading this, I thought, like, I've heard of Anissimus somewhere else. Where do I find him? So I went to find him. If you look at uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, it says this, Tychicus, oh, there he is, the bloke we haven't heard about at all, will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending to you, him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. How cool is that? You see, Tychicus is being sent with Onesimus who is part of the Colossian church, how fortuitous it is to have a Tychicus to intercede on your behalf. Now, who does Jesus send with us? Is there some fortuitous person who mediates on your behalf? Yes, of course there is. Thank you. Jesus is our mediator with the Father. But who goes along with us on a daily basis? The Holy Spirit, thank you. None other than the very person of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we did not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groaning that cannot be uttered. He's there. He's here. Right now, he's with us. We have someone who in a fortuitous basis, Jesus intercedes for us with the Father. The Holy Spirit's with us every day, every moment to help us on our journey. How fortuitous it is to have the Holy Spirit with us today. To finish off his request that he's making, Paul mentions his plans to visit Philemon. Verse 22. Oh, he says, you know, after all the stuff, he says, oh, one more thing. Verse 22, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Philemon's thinking like, was I praying? (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Come on. Hey, how many times has someone said, thanks for your prayers? You go, yeah. (laughs) Huh? You're not the only one. Philemon's going, yep, absolutely, Paul. I'm praying, I'm praying. I was just about to get on my knees. In answer to his prayers. How I love it. 
How could Philemon meet up with the great apostle Paul who had not used any authority over him except love? How could he meet the apostle Paul if he refused to carry out his request, especially as the famous Paul was going to be staying where? At his house! I better do what he says because he's coming to visit home. Where's the gospel equivalent for us? Revelation 21 verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Who's coming to visit your place? God. He wants you to dwell with him, and he wants to dwell with you. Hadn't you better do what he said? Love one another. Forgive one another. Be reconciled to one another. Hey? Do you hear it? Do you see it? Is it getting to you? He's coming to your place. You're going to be in his place. You're going to be in the Father's house. How good. Are you seeing the gospel analogy yet? Let me spell it out for you. The gospel. The original position. God created man perfect. So man was his property. But in sinning, Human beings, mankind, departed from God just as Onesimus had done. But man has also robbed God of his rights and his just dues as our creator and owner. We belong to him, but we've robbed him of his rights. Now we have a very sad plight because as Onesimus fled to Rome, he was in a perilous position. The same perilous position we are in as human beings. Roman law gave a slave no right of asylum. So the law of the Bible gives mankind no right of asylum, no resting place, no place of escape. The law says in Ezekiel 18 verse 20, the soul that sins, it shall die. That's you and me, isn't it? Let's move on a little. God has a partner. Paul, when he writes to, to Philemon, he says in verse 17, if, so if you consider me a partner, you welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul refers to Philemon as a partner here. Now, as I was studying this, some think that, that he and Paul were together in some business concern or it could simply be just their partnership in the gospel. But in Jesus, God has a partner, utterly and entirely one with him. And yet Jesus interposes on our behalf knowing to the full how much we have wronged God and how much we owe him, Jesus says, put it on my account. All our debt to God is put on the account of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. So, grace intervenes. Roman law did have one concession for a slave. It was, this is the one concession, it was permitted for a slave to flee to his master's friend who could plead for him. So, Onesimus sought out his master's friend, Paul, the apostle. And in so doing, Paul obviously presented the gospel to him. And Onesimus was born again. It says in verse 10, He became my son whilst I was in chains. And this must receive Jesus as Saviour and Lord. That's good news, isn't it? How wonderful that is. In a similar way, sinners, that's you and me, we can flee to the Lord Jesus Christ because in him and through him we receive pardon. We are born again as sons and we find both a Saviour and an intercessor and our true Father. The sinner returns to God and is received not as a runaway slave, but received as Christ himself. Paul says to Philemon, receive Anisimus in verse 16, no longer as a slave, but as a dear brother. As I read between the lines in that one, I'm going like, wow, is Paul actually saying to Philemon, receive Anisimus back and set him free? Give him a job. Huh? Put, him, put him in charge of something. I'm reading between the lines there. I don't know. But I'm, I'm seeing the picture there. 
And isn't that what Jesus did for us? If the truth sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Hallelujah. Yeah. No longer a slave to sin. I'm set free. Praise God. What an incredible letter. It's only 25 verses. So full of the gospel from end to end. We're going to delve into it a little further next week. It only takes up one page in your Bible. It's well worth the study. I'd encourage you to spend some time this week, read this letter again and read it again and then read it one more time. Read it every day until you come back next week. And as you're studying it this week, look for the words in Christ. We're going to look at that next week. But what a letter. Do you see the gospel there? Do you see the analogy? We were once slaves and we needed someone to set us free. We ran away from our master. We, we came to, to someone who would intercede on our behalf, the Lord Jesus. He paid the bill. He took the debt in full. He's interceded for us. He's empowered us with the Spirit and we are free. Return back into right relationship with God. That's the gospel. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to pray. Father, Father, thank you, thank you, and thank you again for what you've done for us in Jesus. Thank you for little simple letters like this one in the Bible that just points us again back to our Lord Jesus. We are so grateful, Lord God, for what you have done for us. You have set us slaves free. And we are free indeed in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are holy in Christ. Oh, Lord, we don't deserve any of it. But through your incredible grace and mercy, you give that to us. So with every bit of faith that we can muster, we hold on to you, Lord Jesus, and we say thank you. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.